Hi everyone, and welcome to Spark Spread. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of the inefficiencies in the energy market and taking a stab at quantifying how big the opportunity could be for Tesla. Specifically, I want to take a look at behind the meter distributed energy resources. These are not currently integrated into wholesale markets to the full extent they can be. So we'll take a stab at examining how these can be monetized by Tesla in the future and quantifying the magnitude of the opportunity. Now, if you have no idea what any of that means, I'd suggest you hit pause on this video, watch Tesla Energy 101, and then come back to this one. We're going to be building off some of the details that we described there, so it may be easier to establish that baseline first before watching this video. Now let's get into it. Let's imagine a house with Tesla solar, power walls, and an EV which needs to be charged. In most cases today, a consumer buys these products for their own private benefit and does not receive any compensation other than some savings on their own energy bill. Yet there are many ways in which these assets could provide value to the grid, but for which they are currently not getting paid. In order to understand the opportunity at hand, it is helpful to understand some of the common ways in which energy services are sold in wholesale markets. Note that these are typical examples, but that many locales are structured differently. The point of this video is not to comprehensively quantify all of the ways in which Tesla can make money, but rather to hone in on a ballpark figure for one common market structure to help investors understand the general magnitude of this opportunity. Before getting into the numbers, let's explain the types of services which are compensated in wholesale energy markets. First, energy. This is the physical energy produced by solar panels. This is the most basic and is typically what comes to mind when most people are asked about solar. As we've just said, consumers are buying Tesla solar and power walls today with the benefit of lowering their utility bills. So for purposes of this video, we are going to assume that the customer will get to keep the entirety of this benefit and that Tesla will be able to monetize some other benefits which will be harder to access for an individual consumer. The value streams accessible by Tesla will be an aggregation of many different services which vary by region. For purposes of this video, we'll call these capacity and ancillary services. In many markets, such as PJM and MISO in the United States, there is another type of service power generating assets can provide, and that is called capacity. This is essentially a payment from grid operators to asset owners for having their generators available to produce energy if needed. Think of it as a standby charge. Grid operators will make these payments because they have an obligation to ensure that there is adequate supply for peak days those days when it's 100 degrees out and everyone has their air conditioning units turned on. A relatively recent development in the energy sector is the ability to reduce demand rather than increase supply as a means of qualifying for capacity payments. This is called demand response, and it comes into play for Tesla as they could potentially control large amounts of electric consumption, or load, via its huge fleet of EVs which are frequently plugged in and charging, creating an opportunity for demand response. If Tesla introduces a home HVAC system in the future, this could further increase the load which Tesla can control and thereby become a bigger source of value for managing capacity. Now let's talk about ancillary services. It's easy to think that you can simply put energy onto the grid and everything will just work. But there is much more at play on the grid than simply transporting energy from point to point. For example, the grid must be kept in perfect frequency, meaning 60 Hz in the United States or 50 Hz in much of the rest of the world. There is also an important capability called reactive power which helps the grid to absorb large instantaneous voltage draws from heavy equipment. The grid physically connects millions of energy using assets and energy generating assets, and doing so requires special capabilities like these and many others which generators and batteries can provide. These services are definitely not available in all geographies and can get wonky really fast, so we'll try to summarize these at a high level rather than dive into specific estimates for each potential service. Now that we've described the services solar and storage can offer, let's take a stab at estimating their pricing. But before we do, let's establish some nomenclature. Most of us are familiar with the energy on our utility bills being measured in kilowatt hours, and our utility rate is typically shown in dollars per kilowatt hour. This is of course prudent for energy, but the services we've described here are not delivered in kilowatt hours, so we need to measure them in a different way. Capacity, for example, is the ability to increase supply or decrease demand, and we'll show it here denominated in dollars per kilowatt month. Battery storage and services are one step more complicated because they have a limited duration in which they can charge or discharge. We'll be showing battery payments in dollars per kilowatt hour per month. Capacity is a fairly easy method from which to start estimating a payment. Grid operators, at least the ones which offer capacity payments, hold regular auctions for capacity. These can be as low as 10 cents per kilowatt month, but in my experience, prices like that are typically only indicative of areas with utility monopoly 
that control both the supply and demand side of the equation. On the other extreme, prices will never go higher than around $7.50 per kilowatt month, because at that price you could actually afford to build a new gas peaker plant. Therefore, this is usually called the cost of new entry, or cone. Competitive capacity auctions, with a variety of players, typically have a price of between $3 and $5 per kilowatt month. So we'll use $4 for purposes of this analysis. So back to our house. Let's imagine a house with a 10 kilowatt solar panel. This would imply a potential revenue stream of $40 per month. However, not all types of capacity are created equal. For example, let's imagine a 100 megawatt natural gas plant and a 100 megawatt solar farm are both operating during the middle of a grid emergency in which all generation is needed. The gas-fired power plant can operate continuously for months on end if needed, so it will get the full $4 payment on all 100,000 kilowatts it can provide each month. The solar plant, on the other hand, is not going to be nearly so reliable during a grid emergency. Its output will go to zero every night, and it will only very rarely reach the full 100 megawatts of its stated capacity, even during the day. Conditions really need to be perfect to maximize the output of solar. For this reason, interruptible power plants like solar and wind have a haircut applied to their nameplate capacity. So the home solar system, which is rated at 10 kilowatts, may only get capacity credit for 3 kilowatts. Using this math, a reasonable estimate for the capacity value of a typical home is 3 kilowatts at $4 per kilowatt month, or $12 per month. Having batteries paired with solar certainly helps to increase the usable capacity, but in order to ensure we aren't double counting, we'll examine battery payments separately. Now let's move on to batteries. Markets with payments for services provided by batteries are much less mature. Many Tesla enthusiasts cite the amazing economics of the Hornsdale Power Reserve as evidence that batteries are financial bonanzas, but the circumstances of that particular project are not going to be replicable at scale with anything close to the price received by that project. The issue with that particular part of the South Australian grid is that there are not a high number of generators which can ensure the stable frequency of the grid. So frequency control payments are very high for batteries like Hornsdale which can solve this problem. You could imagine that adding more and more batteries, even to a grid like this one, would result in diminishing marginal returns. Or said another way, if we are examining an opportunity at a large scale of batteries, which Tesla is clearly trying to pursue, we need to make sure that our revenue assumptions account for the decline in service prices going forward. In order to estimate an all-in price for ancillary services provided by batteries, we did some digging here at SparkSpread. We researched various programs to hone in on a dollar per kilowatt hour per month figure. Green Mountain Energy, a Vermont-based electric co-op, offers customers a Tesla Powerwall for a discounted price that works out to be $2.50 per kilowatt hour per month. I also posed the question to Energy Twitter, and I got responses indicating a typical range today of about $1.50 to $2 per kilowatt hour per month. The New York State Energy Research and Development Agency, or NYSERDA as it's known, is a great jumping off point for this analysis as they have a program with a series of tiered payments to battery operators. Early adopters within this program would have had the highest capital cost, since their batteries had the oldest technology. For this reason, they had relatively high payments, starting at nearly $2 per kilowatt hour per month. Later blocks, as they were called, had declining prices, reaching as low as $0.69 cents per kilowatt hour per month. In the future we are imagining, where Tesla is ramping up battery production to reach 3 terawatt hours per year, we need to assume that the prices these assets can receive would decline as battery costs come down and they become more prevalent. For this reason, we are going to make our own estimate with the price of just 50 cents per kilowatt hour per month. Let's assume the home we are imagining has two power walls, meaning storage of just over 24 kilowatt hours. Additionally, it has a Tesla vehicle with a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack. However, we can apply the full price for stationary storage to the Tesla vehicle, since it may not always be available to the grid. Furthermore, Tesla does not, at least yet, have vehicle-to-grid capability, or V2G. So some of the services a Tesla could theoretically provide are not capable with the current technology setup. That said, even today's tech should be capable to provide a significant amount of value simply by being an interruptible source of electric load. This would allow it to quantify for capacity payments at a minimum, which are the largest source of ancillary service payments in most Western grids today. And in the future, I do believe Tesla will enable V2G, thereby enabling the full suite of capabilities to be delivered to the grid. But nonetheless, I do believe a discount of some sort is warranted to account for the fact that vehicles will not be permanently connected to the grid. I've assumed here a 75% discount for vehicle batteries, which is on the conservative side. Putting all that math together, we can calculate monthly battery revenue for our home of $21.58. Adding that to our solar revenue, we reach $33.57, or about $400 per home per year. In just a bit, we'll walk through what this opportunity might look like for Tesla in aggregate, but let's take a minute first to make sure we understand the $400 figure in more detail. First, the good news. 
This is, in my opinion, a realistic middle-of-the-road figure which is sustainable in the medium to long term for Tesla. Right now, these residential assets are typically not being paid for the value they provide, but they absolutely should be, and I believe they will be. And in the near term, the price is likely to be even higher. Additionally, you don't have to bite into the customer's economics to unlock this value stream. As we said at the beginning, the customer makes most of their money on the energy produced and the ability to shift load, which is value we've excluded from these numbers. But now it's time for the bad news. As we also said at the beginning, each market is going to have its own nuances, and Tesla or its partners will need to craft offerings which are uniquely catered to each region. Then they will have to aggregate all of these DERs, and register with hundreds or maybe even thousands of different regulators, grid operators, and governmental agencies. There will absolutely be costs associated with this, and Tesla will likely need to share some of that $400 with the asset owners to encourage participation. For this reason, let's say that the net value Tesla is left with is $200 per home per year, but that this is an operating margin figure, after all revenue sharing and fixed costs are covered. We can now use this figure to hone in on the long-term margin potential of the business. Let's assume that in 2020, there were 250,000 homes which had this combination of solar, storage, and EV charging. In reality, there are more than a million Teslas already on the road, and probably a bit less solar than that. But not all these homes would be in an area that can participate in wholesale energy markets, even if Tesla tried to act as the aggregator. Nonetheless, in order to hone in on the opportunity, let's start with 250,000 homes and grow that figure by 50% per year over the next decade. This is consistent with Tesla's stated growth target for vehicles, and lower than what I am expecting for energy products. We'll do a much more nuanced breakout of these growth rates in the valuation series, but in order to keep the analysis relatively simple for now, let's use 50%. By 2030, that implies that over 14 million homes with DERs would be added to Tesla's virtual power plant operations. In aggregate, there would be 43 million homes. This is a compound annual growth rate of energy as a service of just under 70%. This equates to 2030 operating margin, just on the residential side, of $8.5 billion. And keep in mind that this figure will be growing rapidly and that it represents a source of recurring revenue in contrast to one-time sales like vehicles or energy hardware. Before we wrap up, I want to give you reasons for both pessimism and optimism about this opportunity. Starting with the bad news. This is a highly speculative, back-of-the-envelope analysis based on where I think Tesla is going, not based on where they have publicly stated they are going. Tesla has been mum with the details of their strategy, and it's possible that they will have some different strategy in mind than what I've laid out here. Additionally, as I pointed out earlier, not all areas will have 100% participation in the Tesla virtual power plant, so regulatory or economic hurdles could cause fewer homes to participate than what I've estimated here. Now for the optimism. With the level of scale Tesla is aiming for, it would frankly be stupid for them not to try to monetize these assets, which are right now not being fully utilized to the extent they could be. This gives me confidence that even though Tesla has not disclosed the specifics of their plans, they will certainly do something to access the value stream. Furthermore, it's possible that I've woefully underestimated the opportunity here, particularly if Autobidder could be unleashed in real-time energy markets. Autobidder could manage charging and discharging of these assets and profit from that arbitrage. I have excluded that opportunity from this analysis because that is one step harder from a regulatory standpoint than the path that I've outlined here, which is itself one step beyond what Tesla is doing today. Finally, one last reason for optimism is that I do believe Tesla will aim to radically increase the scale of their home storage systems. I'll go into this theory in a separate video at some point, but I am becoming more convinced that Tesla will aim to increase their capacity in all stationary products by an order of magnitude, meaning that a home with power walls might have 240 kilowatt hours of storage rather than the 24 we have modeled out here. If this is true, then the revenue opportunity would get drastically larger than we've shown here, even at a lower price. All that said, I do believe $8.5 billion of residential energy as a service margin is a reasonable aspiration for Tesla by the year 2030. This will be recurring revenue and as such will have an outsized impact on Tesla's valuation. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. There is still a lot to tell on the energy story and as I hope you can tell, it does take a lot of research to do so effectively. If you find this content valuable, please hit like and subscribe, send it to a friend, or support us on Patreon. A huge thank you to all of our supporters. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Matt Smith, and this is Spark Spread.